Welcome to session one of our study, Living Well, Spending Less. I'm so glad to have you joining me on this journey to a richer life. As we begin our study, let's get right to the heart of the matter and talk about what the good life really means. After all, our culture is full of promises. Society is all too willing to tell us and show us in not so subtle ways about all the things, all the stuff that is supposed to make us happy. We see the ads, read the magazines and blogs, and sometimes even spend hours poring over stunningly perfect images on Pinterest. We listen to the whispers as we watch everyone around us filling their lives with more things, prettier things, better things than what we currently have. We want bigger houses, better cars, newer phones, more accessories and clothing and shoes and toys and gadgets, and whatever else we decide will usher in the good life. But it never, ever does. The whispers are a lie. Lean in, friends, because I have something to tell you. The good life is not what we think it is. You see, stuff in and of itself is not evil. We all need a place to live, clothes to wear, and food to eat. I think it's okay, even natural, to want our home and our clothing to look nice, reflecting our personalities and our sense of style. Money and possessions on their own are not necessarily harmful or destructive. However, the pursuit of them can be. The Bible warns us again and again against this phenomenon. In 1 Timothy 6, verses 9 and 10, Paul writes, Those who desire to get rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evils. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. Not long ago, I found myself in a downward spiral of out of control spending. I had always liked to shop a bit too much, but this was different. Lonely and bored and unhappy, I filled my Target shopping cart, trying to fill the hole inside of me. And as my spending spiraled totally out of control, my husband and I began fighting more and more. Our marriage was in serious trouble and something had to give. Desperate times call for desperate measures, so I agreed to try something new. We established separate bank accounts and a strict budget, and I agreed to what was essentially an allowance. I would get a set amount of money each month to be used for groceries and clothing and household items, and when it was gone, it was gone. I had no choice but to stop spending. Panicked by the thought of giving up what had become an unstoppable need to buy things, I quickly realized that I could make my budget stretch much further by saving on food by using coupons. To me, it was just simple math. The less I spent on food, the more I could spend on all the other pretty things out there just waiting for me to take them home. I'm not saying that was the right attitude. I'm just admitting that's where I was in my own journey. I began shopping for more bargains and became an expert at finding incredible deals on groceries and clothing and other household goods. But I was still shopping, still buying, still trying to fill that void. I was no longer sinking us with my spending, but I was still drowning us in things we didn't need. Eventually, all this stuff I was bringing in started to feel oppressive. Despite the deep discounts, the great deals, I was drowning in things I didn't need or even want. And yet, I wasn't quite sure how to stop wanting it either. One thing I did know is that I wanted a different sort of life for myself and for my family. One that wasn't defined by what we had, but by who we are. In fact, I craved a different kind of life so badly that I began a new quest for the good life. You see, the insatiable desire for more is a disease that permeates every fiber of our being. Overconsumption and unchecked indulgence in anything, whether it's food, alcohol, drugs, or possessions, will eventually destroy us. It doesn't matter if we're barely squeaking by or if we have more than we know what to do with. 
though most of us fall somewhere between those two extremes. Discovering the good life is not just about learning to spend less, but about actually changing the desires of our hearts, shifting our priorities from wanting and hoping for the best of everything in this world to deeply longing to store up a different kind of treasure. Let's take another look at that verse in 1 Timothy. It says, but those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evils. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. But there is more to 1 Timothy chapter 6. In his writing, Paul also includes a call to go down a different path. In verses 11 and 12 and 17 and 19, Paul writes this, But you, man and woman of God, flee from all of this and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. Fight the good fight of the faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called. Do not be arrogant or put your hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but put your hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Do good, be rich in good deeds, and be generous and willing to share. In this way, you will lay up treasure for yourself as a firm foundation for the coming age, so that you may take hold of the life that is truly life. That, my friends, is the good life. Don't fall into the trap of defining the value of your life by what you have or by what you wish you had instead of by who you are. You are a child of a patient, loving, and forgiving father. You are called to serve him and only him. And you are, whether or not you believe it, saved by an amazing, infallible, completely undeserved grace that doesn't care how big your house is, what you drive, or what you wear. How would our perspective change if we took just a few moments to determine what it is we want most out of life? Would our list include having bigger houses, better clothes, nicer cars, or the latest tech gadgets? Do our highest aspirations really include having more things? The Bible is pretty clear when it comes to letting us know what our priorities should be. Galatians 5 verses 22 and 23 explains, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. And then in Colossians 3 verses 12 through 14 we read, Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another if any of you has a grievance against someone. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Notice any recurring themes here? We are very clearly called to live a life of love and joy and peace, to practice kindness and patience, gentleness and self-control, to serve with compassion and humility. There's nothing there about having the best of everything or about taking as much as we can get or even about being in shape or beautiful or dressed to the nines. The reality of being human is that even if we know what we should be aiming for, we will still continually be swayed by the temptations of everyday life. No matter how much we have, it is easy to see what someone else does or is or has and suddenly want that for ourselves. But friends, true contentment will never be found by looking outward. So if we struggle with wanting the things we see around us, maybe we need to stop looking. Maybe we need to stop reading blogs or magazines or watching television shows that make us feel inadequate. Or if our struggle is with certain people in our lives who bring that insecurity, that longing right to the surface, 
maybe we might consider taking a break, at least until we've managed to quiet the discontent in our own hearts. You see, discontentment can sneak up on us so quickly, often before we even realize it's happening. To combat discontentment, I found that it helps our family to have daily conversations about the blessings in our lives and the things we are grateful for. We call it our attitude of gratitude. Philippians 4, verse 4 and 6 and 7 reminds us to rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. The truth is that it's pretty easy to bring our concerns and requests before God. Sometimes we treat prayer like a fast food restaurant, barking out our orders so we can get in and out and be done. But we forget, or at least I do, that we also have to be intentional about thanking God for what he has done in our lives and in the lives of others. Taking the time to consciously list all the specific ways in which we have been blessed can't help but change our perspective. And then something miraculous happens the minute we stop comparing our lives to those we perceive as having more and instead begin intentionally appreciating all that we really have. When we open our hearts just enough to see the blessings we've already been given, our whole worldview changes from one of longing to one of overwhelming gratitude and joy. A life of true contentment is one we have to work for and one we have to actively choose. It means taking the time to identify our priorities and to know what truly matters in life. It means being intentional about desiring the things we can't see rather than all that glitters around us. It means making the decision to stop looking at what everyone else has, but instead working to tame those ever-present comparison and envy inclinations that bubble just below the surface. It means adopting an attitude of gratitude for all we've already been given and being willing to turn our insecurities inside out. Finally, it means actively eliminating those things that tempt us the most. My own transformation from shopaholic to so-called money-saving expert did not happen overnight, nor is it even close to being complete. For me, it has been a slow and often painful process. I have found that Overturning a lifetime of consumption while the rest of the world still screams at me to keep wildly spending does not come without hard work, serious soul searching, and lots and lots of intentional prayer. I have fervently and frequently prayed for God to change my heart and to lead me where he would have me go and to take away my desire for the things of this world. And I am still praying that prayer. I've noticed that as I've made this my daily prayer, my priorities and life goals have slowly begun to shift. I now long for a different type of richness in my life, a richness that comes only from fullness in Christ. I want to find that good life defined so beautifully in the book of 1 Timothy. I want to pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. I want to fight the good fight of the faith. I want to take hold of the eternal life to which I was called. I do not want to be arrogant or put my hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put my hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. I want to do good, be rich in good deeds, and be generous and willing to share. In this way, I will lay up treasure for myself as a firm foundation for the coming age, so that I may take hold of the life that is truly life. The good life to me is this, a life rich in faith, family, friends, and creativity. It is a life full of the richness that God has to offer, a life spent building treasures in heaven rather than here on earth. It is not a life of laziness and greed, but one of discipline, hard work, and self-reflection. 
It may not always be easy or comfortable, but it is always full in abundance and completely secure in Christ. That is the life I want to live. How about you?